Hi, I'm Chris Vam. Hey, I'm PJ Oakland. So the first rule of play is we don't talk about play. But the second rule of play is play is all about breaking the rules. So for the first time, we're going to tell and show you all about the events we've created and how you can unlock your inspiration by bringing freedom and fun back into your creative process. So come play with us. Hey, I'm PJ Oakland, uh, welcoming you to our virtual version of Play, which I co-created with my dear friend uh, Christine Vam. Uh, I've been an actor for about uh, 35 years plus. That's included lots of TV and film and Broadway and lots of other things. Nowadays, that's mostly as an audiobook narrator. I've narrated uh, about 500 titles at this point. The other hats I wear, I'm a producer in the industry with my production company. We cast and produce titles for major publishers. And I'm also a coach, a dialect coach, a performance coach, run a master class series, play obviously as well. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So thanks for being here. I'm Chris Vam, um, co-creator of Play alongside my dear buddy and friend, PJ Oakland. Um, I am an audiobook narrator with... 400 something titles under my belt. I'm also a coach um, helping students who are interested in learning audiobook narration how to use play to help inform their performances. I also have a production company where I get to cast these wonderful people, which is a joy to me. My main goal in life is not to take it so seriously. So that's what we try to do with play. Hi there, I'm Georgina Marie. I'm a voice actor working in animation and audiobooks. I voice for Disney and Nickelodeon and I've done over 400 audiobooks. I also write for animation um, for DreamWorks, Disney, Netflix, and I wrote a book called Improv for Writers and that was based on my years of teaching improv mostly to kids and that's what I brought to play was this opportunity to discover character through improv exercises and movement, and it was super fun. Hi, I'm Julie Finkel. I'm a dance educator, yoga teacher, choreographer, and performer. I have been teaching dance and yoga for over 20 years. What I brought to play was teaching uh, dance improv through games and just teaching people how to connect to their bodies through movement. And we had a great time exploring movement and laughing and really just having fun and letting go. So this is actually a great way to lead into a discussion about how some of our viewers at home can work these play concepts into their day-to-day, -day, whether they're in their booth, whether they're in their writer's room, um, and unlock some of that creativity for themselves if they can't get to one of these play events in New York or LA or something like that. And speaking of those of you watching at home, you might pick up on a couple little Easter eggs along the way as an AirPod died over here or a wired uh, headphone was slotted in over there and it's all just improv, right? So like we say with play, you just got to go with it. Just unlock whatever happens naturally. So Chris, um, what, what would be the first concept you'd like to talk about that people can do at home to try to do some of what we're talking about here? I think what's really interesting about this question, Scott, is that we have to ask ourselves how to play, right? Isn't it so kind of sad that we have to ask the five of us or the four of us to discuss, how do I play, right? So I would suggest the first thing to do is maybe get a journal and start writing down some of the things that really brought you joy when you were a kid. What did you really love to do? What did you love to play with when you were a kid? Was it Legos? Was it paint? Was it exercise? Was it sports? Write some stuff down that used to bring you joy and then give those a shot. I love that. I think that's such a great jumping off point. And doing something like that kind of changed the trajectory of my life, like tapping into that little kid and what she wanted. So that's that's fantastic. I was just going to add on to that, the, the finding joy I think that so many of us exercise because we have to, here are my quotes again, <laughs> um, because we have to, right? We think we have to be healthy or maybe we exercise because we want to look a certain way. But I think that you as, a, as an individual will receive so many more benefits of exercise if it's joyful. 
So it can be a walk to listening to fun music. It can be a dancing in your kitchen. It can be playing with your kids, jumping on a trampoline. It can be anything, but, but enjoy it. Like find an exercise or a way of moving that is super, super fun that you can't wait to do because you're going to get more benefits. Your stress levels will decrease. Your immune system will boost. Um, so, so many more benefits of, of moving in a joyful way than, than moving in a way that's like, I have to move. I have to get this five mile run in. Speaking of, um, of movement, I, I want to say one of the most actionable things I think you can do immediately when you bring the concept of play to your work, things you're doing right now, for example, with narrating an audiobook, you've learned how not to move very much in the booth. You're afraid about, uh, you know, maybe making noise, brushing your shirt, um, various things, accidentally bumping the mic and, you know, hitting the table your iPod's on or clicking your fingernail too loudly when you're scrolling your your script on your tablet screen. Let's you've learned that again, moving from the left brain to the right brain. You've mastered that stuff. You've mastered the lack of movement and making unnecessary noises. Now forget about it. Get back to movement. Inhabit your characters physically. Start to bring that in. When we talk about the differentiating ages, you know, I can start to play an older man who's maybe a, a little bit older than me, uh, maybe a, someone who's a mentor in his 60s and just wiser, and there's not a, not a huge difference. But when I start to bring in the village elder, <laughs> there might be an aspect of feeling my hand vibrate on the cane, and all of a sudden, I notice my breathing starts to change. I, I, I need more oxygen to get out all of the things I'm trying to communicate. So you see, like, if we start to embody the characters even behind the microphone, you're not limited. And notice how I'm gesturing. I try to do this when I narrate. Look at the hands. I'm a New York Italian boy, so we used to have the joke in my family, if you tied our hands behind our backs, we'd become mute. <laughs> but you have to bring the hands back into what you're saying. So just there's where you can have fun in the booth. Don't feel like you're not allowed to move. You'll maintain your appropriate mic proximity. You won't bump into things. It's not going to be an issue, and your performances will benefit as a result. Get physical. And that's, that's something that um, I think leads pretty well into another concept that we talked about as we were planning for our time, which is... Um, taking a performance or taking the idea of a character from one to 10 and then back down some of that rubber band idea we were talking about earlier. Um, can anybody speak to, you know, sort of an, and maybe even give an example of, um, you know, what a one for a character would look like, what a 10 would look like, and then where the way you would actually want to play that character or write that character, where that would sit between those two poles. It's super fun because you get to explore the facets of a character or stretch them in a way that you didn't think of when you were sort of outside looking in. And the best way as a, as a writer or as an actor to understand playing somebody is to be them. It, it is hands down the best way. So even just setting the timer for three minutes and just deciding a minute, a minute, 60 seconds can change your whole point of view of that character of just walking around your office as that character and then if you want to play with their how big they think they are you know how big their their um their view is kind of of the world and, or at different times in the story so you can just that sort of zero to ten of like maybe there's a defeated moment for that character and just like feel that for a moment sit as them or stand as them and just kind of that that kind of it's hard to look somebody in the eye, I was saying earlier, that can that can say a lot. And it's hard to even just look up from the the space is is like barely outside of, you know, an art, you know, elbows length. And and it's just it's just right here. And all the feelings and then with those feelings come thoughts. And that's the exploration is you're gonna find that you're having these thoughts that aren't yours, they're the characters. And you wouldn't have created that for them but they told you that they showed you that and then kind of building where it's like you know there's a point in the story where they're elated they've they've reached the goal through the through the plot they've they've accomplished that 
um, you know, and so their space is much bigger and they're able to see further and, and they stand differently. And just a few seconds of writing as that or and or being in being in that space, being in the body where you're standing tall, you're confident, um, vice versa, kind of beaten down the, the, the part in the story where, you know, all is lost, dark night of the soul, where it's just like, they don't think that they can get up again. And kind of, you can play with those different spaces and, and the emotions that come with that, because those are tied together. The, the way we feel and then our thoughts, they, they're so connected, just like they are as, as humans, our characters aren't any different. So playing around with those um, in that way, whether you're a writer or, or a performer or both, just discovering character can lead you to change your performance. I will, I will say also sometimes we think maybe it's too much and too much is just right. It's less common for, I think, most people to be really big. Um, and, and go go really big and far with something, but especially when you're working with a director, because they can pull you back. So the exploration from to the 10, it's like, I, I push it, you know, I'm adding a number on that. We're going to 12, because somebody can, can pull you back from that. And if you're committed, you never have to apologize to going to 12. You don't have to apologize to going off the dial. I'd like to add something to that. Um, just on that same point, something we've talked about before, I'm a big fan of practice broadly, go big, uh, like Georgina has spoken to this about exploring those higher numbers, go past 10. But I, I like this for a number of different reasons. Um, for example, let's say you're working on an accent or a character voice or something where you're really, really stretching that muscle. When you do that, I always think it's beneficial to go very broad, go very over the top in your practice time at the very least. This is another way of playing, exploring that to the most extreme limits. Then you'll dial back to something that you feel is more appropriate ultimately for the performance, perhaps, or you might find that big actually really works or what you thought was big. But ultimately, a really cool benefit that comes from this is you entrain the muscle memory. So for an accent is such a great example for this, you start to entrain the placement and the sound changes and what has to happen in terms of shape uh, and placement as they're often inseparable. So then that gets sort of locked in. You get the muscle memory of it. So when you back off, you retain a certain authenticity. So practicing in all of these aspects, going big in your prep time, in your rehearsal time, figuring out how these characters move and speak and sound, accents and so on, all of that kind of work, I think, really benefits from the playfulness of going very big, and then you start to dial back. So this is actually really interesting, PJ uh, and Georgina, because um, when thinking of uh, a, a newer narrator, or a, uh, you know, especially a newer narrator in this case, and somebody that's working on their own uh, in a home studio, something we often tell newer narrators is um, when you're doing a character voice, when you're doing an accent, in performance, don't go over the top. Don't make it cartoonish and outlandish. You're going to take the listener out of the experience. Um, you know, better to go a little more subtle if you're not as feeling as strong on your accents and on your uh, character voices. Um, the listener will pick it up as long as you put a little differentiation in there. So um, how can somebody that's new and that isn't working with a director know how to go from that level 10 in practice to get loose and to in inhibit that, in inhabit that character, but then how do they know where to dial it back to so that it's reasonable and not ridiculous uh, for the performance they're trying to give? I think one of the, the key things, like I was mentioning, is in practice time. You go big during your practice time, and then you ultimately dial back because it entrains that authenticity. So when you're working on an accent, you're trying to distinguish. For example, I'll just uh, make something up. I, I remember doing this in our uh, in-person play, for example. Let's say start to go into an accent like this or something. Let's say whatever it is. We don't identify it. It sounds a bit uh, nondescript, but maybe I've got uh, this book where uh, I've got Romanian, I've got Italian, I've got uh, Russian, I've got Greek. Okay, I've got uh, these four. Uh, and I, I like to use this example because I do something like this just on the fly. I make it up. Well, possibly it could be any one of those right now. I could uh, argue that it's got enough going on. It could be all of these things. But notice they're not um, very 
you know, Italian is a Mediterranean, Greek is not Romance language, but also Mediterranean. Romanian is Romance language, but uh, not in Mediterranean, more Eastern European. And Russian, we know there's a, a commonality there, but very far from all of those things. The point is, as I go back to standing, standing uh, standard American, the idea is I can pull something like that off as a generic, right? But what if I've got a book where all four of those characters are speaking to each other? I need to find the distinction between them. So this is a practical example where I've got to practice broadly so I can start to get understanding of throat placement, very back, back in throat, and I'll be instantly here a bit more Russian. Now, that would not be confused with the Italian is much more forward in my mouth, much more Mediterranean. I hear this, maybe the uh, R sound is a bit different from the others. So the point being, now I can go back and forth and you know which is which because I've practiced them broadly and I can make placement shifts and shape ch shifts and uh, sound chain shifts. So I'm using accents as one example. You brought it up on the idea of how far do you go. It's not about cartoony and over the top in the ultimate performance. It's about practicing and building confidence. That's another topic I'd love to get into uh, so that you can really distinguish because if you're challenged with that as an audiobook narrator and you've got 50 different characters to play one of the real key things ultimately is the distinction between them you don't have to do very much but at the very least one of the job requirements is the audience needs to know which character is speaking so by entraining these habits you wind up building some authenticity and can distinguish characters and accents from each other as well one practical example that's great. Thank you. Um, I'd love to get back to that, uh, that other point you made um, in a little while. But one other thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, Chris shared some, some really interesting and fun ideas about just how to shake things out, shake off the sillies, as we say, um, you know, yeah, what yeah. you can do in your, in your own space or just outside of your own space, um, you know, either as a break or I think you said if you've had a really tough day, but then you need to go and perform a more lighthearted performance or write a more lighthearted story. Um, you know, what are some of the ways that you have to, to kind of shake off that mindset and reset? Some of the things that I do to kind of break that tension, to get out of my head, um, maybe I'm feeling tired in the booth. Maybe I keep making mistakes and I'm getting frustrated with myself. I got to take a break. And there's a lot of things that I like to do um, to kind of play and get out of my head. I love stand-up comedy. So if I don't really feel like leaving the booth, I might just like throw up some YouTube videos and laugh really hard. There's some people that I really love and make me laugh. And I'll watch a couple of minutes of that. And trust me, it takes me right out. And then I can get back into my performance and I'm not in my head anymore. I might go in my kitchen and like blast some crazy music and dance around. I might go for a walk. I love love people watching. So one of the things that I will do in order to play is observe and mimic. So I'll go out into the world. Maybe I'll go to somewhere that I don't normally go so I can see different types of people. And I just kind of watch them. You know, I watch how they move. I watch their facial expressions. I watch their body language. I listen to how their voice sounds. And then I try to do it. <laughs> I mean, maybe not in the moment and embarrassing total strangers, but maybe I take it back to my car and then I do exactly what Georgina is talking about, which is I make it really big, right? So that I can understand the muscle memory and how those things are moving in my body. And then I can dial it back down. Um, I think this is a, a hugely practical uh, suggestion that she's making of making things big and then, and then breaking them down, but also doodling and singing and stretching and playing with your kids if you've got them or grabbing your spouse and being like, let's just be silly. My husband and I regularly have paper towel wars. I mean, you just got to do the things that make you laugh and giggle and let the tension go. I mean, listen, the concepts of play and this idea of releasing tension doesn't just help the performer in you or the writer in you. It just helps you, period. So this leads perfectly into um, something I wanted to ask Julie about when Chris is talking about getting up and dancing around your space, um, getting physical. Julie, from a dance perspective, what are, what are some of the ways you can loosen things up, shake things off, um, you know, unlock some of that creativity through physical movement? Um, I think that one of the, the easiest ways is to just take 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever you have. It doesn't have to be this you know, exaggerated amount of time. And check in. 
notice what's happening with you today. I usually start all my yoga classes with like a little before practice inventory. Where are you at? What's feeling good? What do you want to pay attention to? Uh, I think when we don't release our tensions, when we don't let out those frustrations, they get stored in our body and it manifests into, into worry, into chronic pain. And, and that takes our focus away from what we're doing in life. So it doesn't matter if you're an actor or a writer. It just, it takes your focus away from your le- from, from whatever you maybe concentrate, want to c- concentrate on or your family, whatever that may be. So one of the, the little things that I love to do in my classes, even with two-year-olds and uh, well into like my senior population is, is just breathing and circling each part of their body, starting from the head all the way down to their toes. We even do the eyes, but it feels good. Like try circling your eyes. It, it, it actually feels so, so nice. And it's something we don't, we don't do every day. Um, is everybody else doing yeah, it now? Circle your eyes. It, it really, it you're like, oh, wow, my eyeballs need a stretch. Um, yeah. And I mean, for me personally, I love, I love dancing for my kids. They, they love, we, we have music on constantly in my house and I'm always dancing and performing for them. We love to do handstands in our doorways. Um, we love taking walks. So, so whatever it may be for you, um, I think just, just finding joy in something and always checking in, checking in and noticing where you're at um, so that you can give your body the attention that it needs. That's great. Um, also thinking about the, the other side of things, um, people with less or limited mobility, um, I know that we have some things that we've discussed for ways that they can shake off uh, some of the sillies, shake off the rust, get out of their own head, um, that don't require quite so much movement. Um, Chris, I think you were talking about some of those uh, ideas before. What, what can we do in that case? Yeah, sure. Play isn't just about movement, right? Play is about finding the joy. Play is about erasing years of self-judgment and just letting yourself be okay with who you are. So if you've got limited mobility, think about the things that bring you joy. Do you want to doodle some pictures? Is that something that you can do and that you're interested in? Do you want to eavesdrop on some conversations at the coffee shop? Because that's one of my favorite things to do, right? Um, Do you want to just listen to music, right? And just Get quiet with yourself for a minute. There's a million things that you can do that are not physical that bring you joy. And so start making a list of what some of those things are for you personally and then do those. I I just add on the narration side, I know we've got authors uh, with us as well. And, you know, you've got the imaginative side of things through observation and mimicry, even within writing. Chris mentioned mimicry earlier. Huge power. Uh, Mimicry is a superpower. You use it on the narration side, but also from the observational standpoint in all creativity. Um, But then uh, when we do talk about narrating and you're using your voice, even if you are limited in terms of mobility and we, we take out some of the things we talked about with physicality, don't forget, I I often talk about my character voice toolbox as voice toys. Um, So play around like we discussed earlier. Go big with discovering what you're capable of doing with your voice. Have fun. Get silly. Um, You know, do the cartoon voices. You may not use them for the audiobook, but you will find fun in exploring them. So when it comes time to play the more serious scene, you find yourself more connected. And also, you're expanding your toolbox. You're able to do more. You have more range. Uh, so it's it's a win-win. And speaking of your toolbox and expanding it, what, I think one of our superpowers is emotion and the ability to turn that and change it and morph with it and experience it and express it. And because that's our job as as actors, but also as writers, too. And so we can I know it might sound crazy, but even just playing around with the size and the intensity of emotions um, is is really beneficial because like what PJ was saying earlier about accents and we can do that with emotions, too. We can put on a rage playlist. And I love what Julie said about 
these things get trapped in our body, but a way to express them is to move through all kinds of different emotions and move and, and try them on. And, and if our character has, if, you know, they have rage or they have intense love, you know, feeling a little bit of that and then feeling it so it's overwhelming and it's it's flowing out every pore in your body. And uh, yes, I am the crazy person practicing on the highway uh, crying. Uh, that's I do that because as an actor sometimes you just need to express that so uh, making you know those little it's part of the toolkit is the ability to have those not to manipulate but so that again what what PJ was saying about in your practice time you can do this anywhere um, nobody has to be looking at you it's for you you to try and experience when we take that to a 10, when it comes down to the line and where, you know, we have to come up with it in a split second, we we know we can because we've done it. We've done it in our practice time. So it might sound kind of weird, but uh, first of all, it's it's a great release. It's like just letting go of like tension and, you know, and, and moving through all of that. It's It's another way to do that of exploring emotions. You know, even just the, the basic ones that a kid knows and, and playing with those. Like, I'm so, like, scrunching up your feet. I'm so mad. And then, and then you know, just a small version of that. Or you would hardly even know that that person was mad. But we, we can't stay at that level all the time because that can often happen with narration. Is it's so many hundreds of pages and it can start to be... It can be, I've done it myself where it's, it, you know, but if we have these levels that we can go to, it, it becomes organic. We're not even thinking, we, we definitely don't want to be thinking about it where we're just in the booth and then the play from outside and the practice, like PJ was saying about that accent, it just comes through in a way that we, we don't have to plan, we don't have to control, we just let go. And because we've taken our body through all of these different things, even if we're not doing jumping jacks, even if we're just sitting moving the muscles in our face um it, that comes through in an authentic way later it's part of our job to do that kind of practice this is such a cool point too because we have to remember anything is monotone if it's the same thing over and over monotone doesn't just mean a droning robot voice if you're at 11 the entire time for the performance that's monotone as well pretty much anything if you have the same sort of jagged peaks and valleys in your waveform and it's constant you've created some kind of rhythm you zoom out far enough and it's a flat line you know it's like anything becomes monotone when it's repetitious and this is great to keep in mind because again in enhancing your performance and enhancing whatever your creativity is finding that range being nimble being able to call on all these different tools and expanding that growing all of that during that practice time is so critical because then when you need it Boom, it leads to confidence. If I may add at this point, I just want to touch on confidence once again because I, that's come up a couple of times, and that is another really, really serious superpower. But it's an interesting thing because you can't just sit down and say, I'm going to be confident, and then it just sort of happens. It comes from somewhere. It can come from experience. You've done something so much that you just know you're going to be awesome, and that happens magically. Um, but for the rest of us mere mortals, where that doesn't necessarily happen organically, uh, it can happen through preparation. And it can also happen through that looseness. I think Julie mentioned this as well. You, you know, through what we've been talking about, the concept of play, that's another a avenue where it's not the same as prep. Prep is a great source of confidence because you, you're prepared and you get confident because you know what you're, you're going to be doing. But this is another avenue to find that great confidence is the willingness to play and have fun and be free. That is another source that you can tap into for confidence. And confidence is another thing that makes magic happen. Scott, you had asked a question about things that that the people watching can do. What you know, how do I how do I play? And Georgina had said something that really struck a chord with me and um and Julie as well. They were both talking about these things. Julie's talking about doing things with her family. Georgina's talking about doing things alone in her car. And I just want to reiterate, there are no rules to this. You can grab a several of your friends and be like, we're going to have a play night and we're all just going to do goofy characters and take them to 10 and bring them down to one. You can take an acting class at like the local theater. You can grab an improv class that's virtual online. There is no limit 
to your ability to play and to either do it as a solo event if that's how you feel comfortable. But if you're not, if you feel totally weird and strange being by yourself and being goofy, I'm not one of those people. But if you do, right, grab some friends. Grab your neighbors. Grab your other actor friends. Your other writer friends. Go take a, a go take a class. Um, you're not limited in any stretch. Play has no limits. Here's another one for you, Scott. I mean, just things we can do. We talked about the concept of frustration, right? And that can really be your enemy. Like suddenly your creativity goes down. Julie talked about tension and all that stuff snowballs out of control. You get tighter and things stop working well. Well, one of the great frustrations I think we all encounter as audiobook narrators is when you have that word you can't say. And uh, this comes up all the time. People talk about it and on social media, like their nemesis words. Probably one of the most common one would be probably the word grasped, right? Um, uh, he grasped the cup. Everybody hates that word, right? But because articulation is important in audiobook work, we got to get them right. Well, when you find yourself in that moment and you've done the line five times, seven times, 12 times, you keep punching yourself in and you're just about ready to break something, here's a quick thing you can do in terms of the code switching that I really, really think we believe in and endorse in the concept of play. Code switch. Stop for a moment, make a game right? So here's something you can do. You break it down. Grasped is because it ends in a D and it follows an unvoiced consonant. The D turns into a T. So what we're talking about basically is grass and a P and a T. So I can turn that into a game for myself and I can start smiling and laughing and say, grasped, grass, grasped, grasped, grass, grasped, grasped, grass, grasped. And now all of a sudden I go back to the line and I say, he grasped the cup. And so, oh, I did it. I can move on now. But it's like find, even in the goofiest, most ridiculous, dopey things, you can find the fun. And the thing that made you want to break the cup, now suddenly you were able to grasp the cup. And that's the point, right? Um, so it's like all of these things are actionable and you can do them and you can find the fun. You can find the reason to smile and be goofy and be silly and make your day better and ultimately make your performance better. And that, that leads in perfectly as we sort of round out this part of the, of the conversation and move towards the end here, which is that, um, you know, again, Chris brought up a great point to me about uh, you're getting frustrated. Um, what is frustrating you? How do we identify and remove what is frustrating us when we're trying to create, right? So this is not about being intentional, about setting up time for positivity. This is more about being intentional, about finding what negativity you might not be aware of and, and how to remove it. What, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, really starting to understand your triggers, right? What are the things that make you crazy? So Julie talked about in the morning making coffee and like putting the music on and dancing. And I would add in, stay away from the news and social media first thing in the morning, right? Don't set yourself up with all of that negative self-talk that happens to a lot of us when we're dealing with things like social media or listening to the news, right? I'm not saying that those things don't have their place, but for me personally, Personally, it is not a great way to start my day. Also, I stay away from emails first thing in the morning or when I'm in the booth and trying to perform. I stay away from those things that I know are going to drag me down some crazy rabbit hole of crazy, my own personal version, and I stay away from it in the booth. I tell people this all the time. Work happens out there. Play happens in here, right? I don't bring work into my play space, right? The only thing that happens here is fun is the work, is the narration. Out there, that's where I check emails. That's where I look at social media. That's where I read the news, but I don't do it in this space. And I make those very separate. It's sacred. I mean, a lot of writers it's sacred. Make, you know, their writing time is like not negotiable. They've worked out deals with whoever they have to, to have that block of time. And, and I think that that's because it's, it's sacred. When there's an interruption, it inter interrupts the, the state of flow that we get into when we're narrating or we're writing or we're doing any kind of creative endeavor that we're impassioned with, even gardening. It's like, think about that. When you're gardening, do you think like it's okay to like stop, go in, take a look at, read disturbing news and then get back to the butterflies? It's like it interrupts, it interrupts that. Um, I don't know if that helped at all, but. I think. I think it's sacred. No, it totally does. I think another, another <laughs> way totally you can does. look at it is um, 
maybe not necessarily with the news or social media, but, but if, if you have a frustration built up from something in work or, or life or whatever it may be, I'll give yourself like two minutes and really feel it. Sometimes we fight, we fight, we fight it, we fight it, and we push it away. Those feelings are natural. That's what's, that's part of being a human being, feeling frustration, feeling sad, feeling that. So let yourself feel it for a moment and then, I mean, really feel it, <laughs> like get into it. And then, okay, exhale it out. I've done that. I've, I've felt that emotion and, and I'm going to move on. Like I felt it and now we're moving on. So maybe just allowing yourself to have that moment with it, sit with it. And then, and then maybe that's all you need. Maybe you can let it go after that instead of just fighting, 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 fighting it. I love that. In the immortal words of Confucius, shake it off. Yeah. Or <laughs> Florence yeah. and the might, Machine, right? <laughs> might actually yeah. have been Taylor Swift. But the point is, yeah. Taylor Swift, whether it's Taylor think. Swift anyway. or Confucius, the point still stands. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing to a good place to, to leave this and to wrap things up. And so I want to touch on each of you and, 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 you know, sort of give you each the opportunity to just say like, you know, what's next in this space, in this idea for each of you. And um, just, you know, really quick, how can, how can our viewers connect with you? And we'll put it under the video, uh, you know, on YouTube and we'll, we'll have a link to your individual website and stuff like that. But, you know, sort of like, what's your next project you're most excited about? Um, and, uh, you know, where, where can our viewers find you if they want to follow up with you individually? Let's go to Julie first, put you on the spot. All right. My, uh, website is juliefinkel.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. My next project that I'm most excited about, which I think is perfect for this, for this uh, subject of play, is that I choreograph uh, for a, a high school in town, um, this, this sort of a musical production number, and it's not for the students, it's for the parents. And when I tell you it is the highlight of their year, which it just, it, it like brings tear to my eyes to see these people have so much fun. They are not actors. They are not performers by trade, but they love it. And, and I can't wait to work with them. So that's coming up in January and I'm super excited about that. All right, thanks, Julie. Uh, and so PJ, how you doing, man? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for having us, by the way, again, to do this. Uh, it really, what a treat and thank you. It's, uh, it's always good to be with you and all the things we've done together. Thanks for being here. It's, it's great to have you. And I hope, I hope and I know our audience agrees. Um, where can our audience find you and what do you have going on next other than this? Always keeping things interesting because of all the different hats I wear. It never gets boring on the uh, narration side, busy. Uh, you can find me at uh, pjoakland.com for all things acting, all things coaching, drdialect.com, D R D I A L E C T.com, drdialect.com. That's for all private coaching and whatnot, uh, different special programs. And then I, I should mention Dion Institute, um, which I co founded with uh, Deborah Dion, and we do our wonderful masterclass series, which has been amazing. Uh, and that just brings together narrators of so many different uh, skill levels. We've had narrators with zero books, narrators with literally a thousand books they've done. Everyone learns from each other in this amazing environment. And it really speaks to something I get very excited about, which is the evolution of performance. So when we do things like this, things like that, you see how performance evolves from like old movies to the present, old audiobook narrations to the present. So when, uh, when everyone engages with stuff like that, it really excites me because we're on the, the cutting edge of what creates that, that progress and evolution. That would be at uh, DionInstitute.com, D-E-Y-A-N Institute.com. So, yeah, there's always fun stuff. Uh, look me up, uh, connect on social media. I'd love to hear from you. Great. You know you will hear from me. <laughs> uh, Georgina, what, um, how are you doing? What, what's, what's up next for you? Um, and how can people find you if, they, if they'd like to work with you? Hi there. I'm very grateful to be a part of this conversation. So thank you for having me. And I'm hard at work on writing and voicing the next things as media and things evolve. I'm actually in, um, I'm, I'm, ex I'm kind of nervous to announce, but excited to announce that I'm recording a stand-up comedy, a scripted stand-up comedy podcast. Um, so pretty excited. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about that. Been inspired by, you know, the world and it's not been easy not to be a live performer and then not be live performing. I mean, we all know there's so many, there's so many changes, but embracing the opportunities is good. And if I can help anybody in, in any way, whether it's through, um, 
I don't know how, whatever. I'm around. I'm out in the world. I'm at GeorginaMarie.com and uh, at social at Georgina Marie. And I know the, the name's kind of funny. It's J-O-R-J-E-A-N-A, like blue jeans. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> but I'm Marie is just Marie, you. Like, you, like you would expect to see Marie. Yeah. So there you go. Um, excellent. Well, thanks so much for being with us. And to round things off, we have the inimitable Chris Vam. Um, she of, uh, of two, um, uh, vestigial H's, uh, if we're going to talk about names, which is I, something that I always like to, to poker about. Um, but, uh, what are you and your extra H's, uh, up to and where, where can people find you and your extra H's? Well, what makes my extra H's so great is that it's really hard not to find me because I don't know of many other VAMs out there. So on all the social media places, um, you can find me. Um, I think on Instagram, I'm VAM Audio. On the Facebook, I'm Christine VAM Keys. Um, and then on the Twitter, which I'm never on the Twitter, I think I'm just Christine VAM. Um, and then if you are interested in emailing me about something in particular, um, Christine at VAMAudio.com is where you can find me and what am I up to? What am I not up to? I feel like I'm just like reiterating what PJ says. I wear all these hats. I play all these things. Um, I've been coaching. Um, I've been narrating. I've been playing. And um, recently, because I love collaboration, I got together with Jessica Kay and we created a company called Curated Audio where we really focus on the independent author and help bring their stories to life really simplify the process for them. And you can find us at curatedaudio.net. Um, so to, to put a final stamp on things, uh, if you could give me your quick, um, one thing that you would want people to take away uh, from our time here today, what, what is, you know, of the concepts we've covered, what is the most impactful, most important, um, you know, little nugget that people can carry with them as we go? Okay, the one nugget I would say in relation to play is, if it's not bringing you joy, don't do it. It's time to play. Well, we've said all the important stuff. So since we're keeping this concise, I would simply say Muppet dance your way through life. So that's all. <gasps> I was going to yes! say, yeah, can I get an example of that? Yeah, that's perfect. Well, that's, that's, imp I would almost, you know, <laughs> I can't, let's everybody do it. See, we're playing now. We're playing now. Yeah. I hope this makes it it's into all about the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, speaking my of dance. Else. My turn. I would, what is your big takeaway? Uh, my biggest is just piggybacking on on uh, Chris's is find movement that that brings you happiness, that makes you excited. So an exercise that you want to do every day. I just wanted to say thanks so much to all of you for, for joining us today. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. I hope uh, you're going to go and play in uh, the best way for you and get a little silly and then bring it all back into your performance or your creation and um, use it to just really create the best possible way you can. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time on ACX Universe. Thank you.